Hey friends, in order to watch this video, you'll need to purchase Zoom in Bucks. They're not redeemable anywhere, are extremely expensive, subject to inflation, and go great on salads. Annoying at best, internet mob forming at their worst, microtransactions and in-game currency can be the death knell of a game. So grab your Zoom in Bucks and get on board for the 10 times games tried to take all of our money. If there's one thing all gamers can unite over, it's their hate for pay-to-win games. Star Wars Battlefront 2 was one of the worst of all time. Opinions are divided over microtransactions, but as long as the items you buy or get in loot boxes aren't giving you in-game advantages, people are generally okay with it. Unfortunately, not every publisher knows this <laughs> EA. Enter Reddit. After Reddit user MBM Maverick asked why he had to pay $80 for a Star Wars game with Darth Vader locked, EA took the opportunity to respond with the most downvoted post in the history of Reddit. EA said that we needed pride and accomplishment to unlock different heroes, which is a disgusting, veiled money grab hidden behind the fact that players would need to spend 40 hours to unlock Vader and another 300 to make him heroic. Sorry EA, but you can't call a paywall player progression. This whole debacle was in addition to their loot box system, which had not just cosmetics, but player enhancements too. Essentially making Battlefront 2 a pay to win game. Add in a number of government responses about gambling and video games, and there you have Battlefront 2. After the criticism reached its height, EA decided to stop the microtransactions. Later, they reintroduced them, but making sure they were only cosmetic in nature. Blizzard created Diablo 3 auction houses to legitimize third-party trading, so that players would stay in the game to do their trading instead of going to third-party sites that were rampant with fraud, scams, and hacking. There's nothing wrong with this idea in principle. Too bad it was attached to a game where loot was everything. I don't think it's safe here. The presence of auction houses shifted gamers' incentive from playing the game to trading within it. Why spend time killing monsters with a low drop rate for anything good when you could just keep finding ways to buy low and sell high in the auction house? Former Diablo streamer put it this way, I didn't purchase an auction house simulator, I purchased a hack and slash dungeon crawler. The game lost any payoff for those that spent the most time playing. As long as you reached level 70, you could have the best gear if you were willing to pay for it. Blizzard president agreed that the game would be better without auction houses, and two years after launch, they were removed from the game forever. doesn't remember Candy Crush Saga. The casual puzzle game that came out in 2012 that turned your mom and your grandparents into game addicts. Hours upon hours were spent crushing candies, all for that triple star rating. It was also the time of playing Word Feud with your weird aunt and sending loads of annoying requests on Facebook to get that extra corn for your farm. Ah, what a time to be alive. Candy Crush made it so tempting to buy these extra moves, lives, boosters, or even unlock a level. And with thousands of levels to beat, 4,565 as of today, the temptation never ended. And don't call Candy Crush a game of the past either. With a few spin-offs, the Candy Crush series made a whopping $1.5 billion in 2018. Players spent nearly 4.2 million a day in the Google Play and Apple App Store, and it's still in the top 10 globally for both most downloaded game and most consumer spend. Who would have guessed that our aunts and uncles could spend so much money on a mobile game? One of our favorite video game dragons started off the Skylander series with Skylander's Spyro's Adventure. The game, or rather the starter pack, was sold at $69.99 and came with three starter figures and a summoning portal. This is enough to play the game until the end, but you'll need to spend a little bit more money if you want to complete the game. So the game basically tells you there's no other way to play the game than to 100% it. They have teasers, they lock parts of the game, and lock character-specific challenges. To play them all, you'll need to shell out $7.99 to buy figurines, 29 of them in all. Activision even added extra adventure and legendary packs, plus some legendary versions of already existing characters, making the grand total for this game a whopping $320. It didn't stop there either. There were five more Skylander games released, and more and more figures were added over the years, and there are now over 300 playable characters to collect. 
Sorry, Spyro, we aren't getting anywhere near a game like this. Shark cards are a form of microtransaction available in Grand Theft Auto Online. The cards give players in-game currency to buy different things. Some GTA Online players love the shark cards, saying that it has given the community years of free DLC and there's no mandatory to buy them. But some players say it affects game design, and that Rockstar has to make parts of the game boring or a bit of a grind to encourage shark card purchases. Others point to inflation and that prices in-game have gotten out of hand, while the prices of shark cards have remained the same. Just as an example, if you've got, say, $125 lying around, you could choose to buy the Gold Luxor, a solid gold private jet seemingly used to fly around Los Santos and spit on your poor brethren alone. Regardless, Grand Theft Auto has a huge and loyal online community and has made Rockstar a historic buttload of money. That's more than any other form of media in history, with over 90 million units sold and $6 billion in revenue. Angry Birds 2, meet Angry Gamers. Angry Birds 2 launched in 2015 with paywalls, timer walls, in-game ads, and microtransactions. An absolutely dizzying array of ways to alienate a player base. It's almost as if they were trying to catch up from not monetizing the first games enough. What Angry Birds 2 was especially good at was stringing together all these paid elements together. Lose your five lives, here's a paywall. Finish a level, here's an in-game ad. Been having too much fun for too long? Here's your timer wall. What sucks is that developer Rovio ruined what was actually a pretty good sequel. Most reviews noted the elevated gameplay, better graphics, and challenging stages. Too bad most players didn't have the chance to see it. If you haven't played Angry Birds 2, you can still check it out on iOS and Android for free. Sort of. My five-year-old nephew loves trains so much. And God willing, I will never introduce him to this game. Though some may like to call this game a train simulation, we prefer to phrase it like this Steam user. It's a DLC simulator. This game has an absolutely staggering amount of inane DLC. Just look at it! We scrolled through during a 40% off sale, mind you, and still found a way to rack up a $3,000 cart. The total store has at least $8,000 worth of DLC, but then again, who's gonna tell me I can't live without my BR Class 52 Loco add-on or my Norfolk Southern Heritage SD708? What this game feels like it's doing is exploding the insane geekdom of train hobbyists. The core game comes with very little, forcing players to spend lots of money for the highly specific trains they came to the game for, and they often came buggy or poorly made. Imagine a world where Pokemon did the exact same thing. Gotta catch them all for the low, low price of $10,000. Okay, be right back. Gotta pick a new train video for my nephew. NBA 2K19 is a game under Take 2. The same people that brought us GTA Online, and to no one's surprise, it's a game riddled with microtransactions. The game makes you use premium currency for everything in the game. They call it VC, and a pair of shoes goes for about 5,000 VC, which is equal to about two bucks. The game asks you to get VC pretty much everywhere. On almost every screen, you'll be told to spend money on a game you've already spent $80 on. In the My Career mode, Players have to reach a rank of around 75 before they can even begin to think about competing online. That can mean grinding for dozens of hours or maybe hundreds of hours. Otherwise, you'll miss every other shot, even if it's a layup. We did hesitate in putting this game on our list though. Take Two has pressured publishers to take down poor reviews in the past. The Sixth Access wrote, it doesn't take a genius to figure out you'll have to spend a long time grinding or using microtransactions to level up quicker. This is essentially the practices of a free-to-play game in a full-priced sports title. The Sixth Access then changed the review as a result of ongoing pressure from Take Two. So if you guys see a video from us naming 2K19 as our one true god, you'll know why. In 2005, there was no other way I wanted to get Carpal Tunnel more than by playing Guitar Hero. Attempting through the fire and flames at 4am with my eyes beginning to cross is something I'll never forget. And in 2015, Activision and Freestyle Games try to take that all away from us with Guitar Hero Live. They launched the game with only 42 songs, which is about as half as many as previous versions, and they introduced the steaming bag of hot garbage known as Guitar Hero TV. With their eyes on Spotify and Apple Music, they thought that they could charge people who spent almost $100 on a game to play some more songs for $6 a day. You could also buy 10 plays for $2.50 if you had about half an hour to waste. 
Suffice it to say, the internet didn't like this very much, and people boycotted the game. Three years later, Activision took down the servers for GHTV, making 92% of the song library inaccessible. We hope companies like Activision and EA will learn from charging players like this, but sadly, we haven't seen much evidence of that yet. Until then, we'll have to find other games to destroy our hands with. Fortnite is a cultural phenomenon, and the numbers are gigantic. $2.5 billion in revenue last year, and the average player spending almost $60 on a free-to-play game. If there were ever a time for the Take My Money meme, it's now. But how did Fortnite do it? Nothing you purchase in Fortnite can make you better anyway. Everything is cosmetic. Epic Games made this all happen by creating scarcity. They put a skin in the store and make it available for only one day. If you miss it, you'll see other players running around with it in the lobby the next day. Which means next time you see a skin you like, you know that you have to buy it immediately or experience FOMO. Fortnite's Battle Pass also brings in huge amounts of money for this company. With the Battle Pass, players can unlock a series of weekly challenges that lets them unlock wraps, emotes, skins, and more. And with a relatively low cost of $10, it's no wonder that there are reports of Epic selling as many as 5 million Battle Passes in a single day. There are a lot of elements involved with Fortnite's success, and therefore taking of our money, but most interestingly, a survey found that 30% of people admitted that Fortnite was the first game in which they'd purchased a microtransaction at all. See you all in lobby, where you'll find us saxophoning over our latest kill. So, if you have any money left, be sure to spend it on groceries or rent. Otherwise, there's no shortage of microtransactions to throw it away on. Is there a game you spent a staggering amount of money on? Let us know below, and be sure to like and subscribe.